The Russian multipurpose laboratory module, NAKA, delayed by nearly 15 years, has finally docked with the International Space Station. Since its launch last week from Baikonur Cosmodrome, the module had suffered a series of glitches that had raised concerns about whether the docking procedure would go smoothly. The 13 meters long and 4.2 meters wide module approached the ISS on Thursday morning for the docking. The spaceship inched forward slowly, aligning itself exactly with the ISS port that was waiting to receive it. Its docking system met the port and locked it into place, forming a seal so that cosmonauts could open the hatch and access their new facilities. Docking was made at the space-facing port of the Zvezda module, which was recently vacated by the PERS module on July 26. After serving the International Space Station for 20 years, the Russian PERS module was detached from the orbiting outpost and pulled away by the Progress MS-16 cargo ship last Monday. PERS was the first major ISS module to be decommissioned at the two-decade-old outpost. Following the separation of PERS and Progress MS-16, the cargo craft began a series of maneuvers to push the duo away from the outpost and set it up on a trajectory to eventually perform a deorbit burn. Roughly three hours after successfully docking to the station, the NACA module suddenly began firing its thrusters without command. This caused the station to leave its nominal orientation and end up 45 degrees out of alignment. Russian mission controllers spotted the problem right away, and the Zvezda module began firing its thrusters to try to fix it. However, NACA's thrusters kept firing, and the two modules were essentially fighting each other, with NACA pushing the ISS out of alignment and Zvezda attempting but failing to properly fix the situation. At the same time, NASA ordered the station into free drift mode to relieve stress on the outpost's modular connection points. According to NASA officials, the station lost attitude control for a total of about 47 minutes. Eventually, Russian controllers were able to get NACA's thrusters to stop firing, and the station's attitude control was restored. The problem, while serious, did not pose a threat to the safety of the seven people on board. Although NASA and Russian controllers had inhibited the thrusters to prevent them from firing again, station controllers in both Houston and Moscow were still working to understand what caused NACA to fire its thrusters. With the investigation into the unplanned thruster firing continuing, NASA decided to postpone the scheduled July 30 launch of Boeing's Starliner commercial crew vehicle to the space station. The uncrewed mission, dubbed Orbital Flight Test 2, is now scheduled for no earlier than August 3rd on an Atlas V rocket. According to a report by Ars Technica, Blue Origin will be launching Project Jarvis, which aims to design fully reusable rockets as a direct answer to SpaceX's reusable Starship project. The project follows another speculation in late May that Blue Origin's new Glenn rocket will use stainless steel instead of metal. For those unfamiliar, stainless steel is the same material used for SpaceX's Starship rockets. According to the rumor, Blue Origin was changing the primary structural material of its new rocket from an aluminum alloy to stainless steel. However, Ars Technica's senior space editor Eric Berger said on Twitter that the rumor is untrue. He said the initial stage of the new Glenn was not going to be stainless steel. However, newer rumors now say that a new version of Blue Origin's new Glenn will now be designed to feature a fully reusable upper stage, which will have stainless steel propellant tanks. Apparently, the reason for the material shift is because Blue Origin founder Jeff Bezos wants to lower the launch cost of New Glenn. The vehicle's large upper stage, with a 7-meter diameter and two B3U engines, is costly, and Jeff Bezos is looking for ways to make the overall rocket more economical. Over the last year, Bezos took note as SpaceX launched and landed its Starship vehicle. This is one of the reasons he decided to initiate a project named Jarvis at Blue Origin. For now, the company plans to launch New Glenn initially with an expendable second stage before transitioning to the fully reusable upper stage in the mid-2020s. Sources say that the progress on Project Jarvis has been quite fast, and initial tank tests could begin as soon as this fall at Blue Origin site in Florida, followed by further tests if the approach proves feasible. Once the reusable rocket is operational, it will be in serious contention against SpaceX when it comes to delivering heavy payloads into space. NASA's InSight lander has recently revealed the depth of Mars crust and the size of its central core by using data from dozens of Marsquakes captured since the probe landed in 2018. The seismic experiment for interior structure is a dome-shaped instrument that sits on the surface of Mars and can pick up seismic events hundreds or even thousands of miles away. Since its deployment, the mission has recorded 733 distinct Marsquakes, about 35 of which were used for the current work. Three papers based on the seismometer's data were published last week, and their analysis shows that the Martian crust is between 20 to 37 kilometers thick. Below this is the mantle, which extends about 1,560 kilometers down to the Martian core, which has been revealed to have a radius of 1,830 kilometers. A key finding is that the Martian core is still molten, while most scientists had assumed it would be solid. 
NASA's Mars Helicopter Ingenuity completed its 10th flight on Mars and surpassed the one-mile mark of its total flight distance. This flight, completed on July 24, was the most complex of all Ingenuity flights and saw the helicopter perform multiple maneuvers while passing through 10 distinct waypoints. As part of this flight, Ingenuity was sent to explore Raised Ridges, a rocky area in Jezero Crater south of the landing site of the Perseverance rover. During the flight, the 1.8 kg Mars helicopter reached a maximum altitude of 12 meters, a new record height, and flew about 233 meters. From takeoff to landing, the entire flight lasted 165.4 seconds. Ingenuity is now parked on its seventh Martian airfield as mission scientists continue to examine telemetry and images from the flight. Meanwhile, six weeks after landing, Perseverance is now gearing up to collect its first samples on Mars, a milestone that could happen this week. The rover is scouting out targets in a geologically interesting part of Jezero that the mission team calls Crater Floor Fractured Rough. Perseverance will study its chosen target in detail with a variety of instruments before actually collecting material in a multi-step process that will take about 11 days from start to finish. Now, let's discuss some of the major Starship updates from the past week. Since its static fire test on June 19, the Super Heavy Booster 3 has been standing idle on the suborbital launch pad for the past two weeks. And last week, workers disconnected the plumbing's and electrical connection from the booster, indicating that the Booster 3 test campaign was over or suspended. Meanwhile, SpaceX's South Texas Starship factory appears to have shifted into high gear and is already rapidly constructing the first orbital-class Starship and Super Heavy prototypes. Assembly of Super Heavy Booster 4 is nearing completion inside the high bay. While it took 41 days for SpaceX to complete the Booster 3 assembly, Booster 4 is nearly twice as fast as Booster 3 in reaching its maximum height. With work beginning around July 16, Booster 4's oxygen tank is currently just lacking the engine section, and the booster's methane tank was stacked to completion. On Thursday, July 29, SpaceX founder Elon Musk shared a photograph of the thrust section of Booster 4 on Twitter. Also known as the engine section, the exterior of this aft end of the booster is where the 29 Raptor engines of the prototype will be attached. The feed system of this aft section has a network of plumbing through which propellants are delivered from the vehicle's fuel tanks to its engines. Musk added that what we are currently seeing is just the primary fuel lines, and a more complex maze of secondary plumbing and wiring is about to come. The structure and all associated plumbing must withstand more than 66,000 kilonewtons of thrust during liftoff. One of the four grid fins of the booster was installed on July 30. Unlike the Falcon 9 boosters, which use grid fins only for increased accuracy and precision during landing, in a super heavy booster, the fins also act as load points for catching the booster. Moreover, on a Falcon 9 booster, the fins are kept folded during launch and were unfolded as the booster prepares to re-enter into the Earth's atmosphere. But according to Elon Musk, the fins of a super heavy booster could not be pulled back, leaving it in an unfolded state during launch. Meanwhile, next to the high bay, inside the mid-bay, the first orbital-class Starship prototype, Starship 20, is taking shape. The stacking of the tank sections of Ship 20 is now complete, but the prototype is yet to receive its aft fins and nose cone section. The aft fins of the vehicle are currently lying on a stand at the build site, meanwhile work on the nose cone is progressing. The nose cone is currently receiving its thermal protection tiles. Once the heat tiles installation is complete, the nose cone attached to its four-ring barrel section will be stacked atop the propellant tank section. As SpaceX is preparing Starship for its debut orbital flight test workers stacked the ninth and the final section of the orbital launch tower on July 28. This giant orbital launch tower, described as Mechazilla by Elon Musk, will help SpaceX lift Starship above Super Heavy on the launch mount, as well as catch the booster as it returns from space. Before stacking, this four-legged tower section has been outfitted with several new parts and components. On July 24, a horizontal element connecting the diagonal columns of the section was installed, followed by five giant pulleys. These hardware will become part of a high-power pulley system that will pull the arm carriage up and down the tower, allowing it to grab, lift, and catch starships and super-heavy boosters. Additional pulleys are expected to be installed in the coming days. In addition, flags of the United States of America and SpaceX were hoisted on the tower. With the tower now more than 145 meters tall, SpaceX can begin the process of outfitting it with a complex system of actuating arms, propellant plumbing for Starship, hydraulic and electric systems, a network of cables and pulleys, and most importantly booster catching and Starship stacking mechanism. The parts of the booster catching mechanism and associated carriage have begun to arrive on a near constant stream of flatbed trucks to the launch site. Two distinct structures are in work are a large framework assembled out of yellow metal tubes, and the other a flatter black structure being assembled out of prefabricated components. 
Although the launch tower still needs a lot of work, there is no doubt that SpaceX will be able to activate the launch tower with a basic level of functionality, with only a few more weeks of work. In an effort to finish the orbital launch tower works and stack the Starship and booster prototypes to launch into orbit, Musk has called on several hundred employees from other SpaceX sites to temporarily relocate to the area until the project is finished. Employees have been spotted arriving at the Brownsville South Padre Island International Airport and booking rooms at nearby hotels. While a date has not been set for the orbital launch, according to various sources, Musk gave them a very short timeline to have the vehicle stacked at the launch pad. There is a rumor that the stacking of Starship 20 and Booster 4 will take place before August 5. As work progresses in Texas, SpaceX received a piece of glad news from the U.S. Government Accountability Office. Recently, the Government Accountability Office rejected Blue Origins and Denetics' attempt to block the lunar landing contract that NASA awarded to SpaceX. NASA in April 2020 selected SpaceX, Blue Origin, and Denetics to design and build a lunar human landing system. But in April 2021, NASA decided to go only with SpaceX and its Starship vehicle for the Artemis program. SpaceX's proposal for the human landing system program came in at $2.9 billion, around half of Blue Origin's $5.9 billion proposal. While the budget was apparently the biggest factor, NASA also praised Starship's innovative design and future-looking technology that might also one day be used on Mars. NASA's choice didn't sit well with Blue Origin, which filed a protest to the Accountability Office claiming that NASA's process and reasoning for selecting SpaceX were flawed. After three months of investigation, the Government Accountability Office announced its decision on Friday, finding that NASA did not violate procurement law or regulation when it decided to award the contract only to SpaceX. According to GAO, after noting that SpaceX submitted the lowest-priced proposal with the highest rating and that the offers submitted by Blue Origin and Denetics were significantly higher in price, NASA concluded that they lacked the necessary funding to make more than one award. The Accountability Office further concluded there was no requirement for NASA to engage in discussions, amend, or cancel the announcement. Elon Musk reacted to the decision by tweeting GAO with a flexed bicep emoji. Meanwhile, four days before the GAO's decision, on July 26, Jeff Bezos published an open letter to NASA Administrator Bill Nelson, offering to pay more than $2 billion to get the agency's human landing system program back on track. In effect, the founder of Blue Origin says he will self-invest in a lunar lander because NASA does not have the money to do so. On top of that, Blue Origin would self-fund a Blue Moon test launch to low Earth orbit, a feat likely worth hundreds of millions more. In exchange, Bezos said, Blue Origin would accept a firm fixed-priced contract and cover any system development cost overruns. But since the Government Accountability Office dismissed Blue Origin's protest, NASA will likely proceed with SpaceX rather than responding to Bezos' letter. Furthermore, the protest by Blue Origin and Denetics prevented NASA from working with SpaceX for several months, and the GAO ruling in its favor allows the agency and SpaceX to come up with a timeline for landing humans on the moon. Moving on to other Starship updates, on July 28, a fleet of SpaceX's self-propelled modular transporters left the build site with two major pieces of hardware in tow. One of those payloads was the orbital launch table that left the factory after nearly six months of assembly and outfitting. Designed to secure, fuel, and launch orbital Starships, the launch table has to be able to withstand approximately 5,000 metric ton weight of a fully fueled Starship Super Heavy launch system. The table also has to hold in place the launch vehicle during static fires and pre-launch ignitions that could produce up to 75,000 kilonewtons of thrust. The table was lifted and placed on top of the launch mount on July 31st. Along with the launch table, for the first time in three months, workers transported a ground support equipment tank to the launch site. GSE tanks are designed to store the propellants needed for the Starship's orbital flight. Hours after arriving at the launch site, the tank was installed at the tank farm. Around 10 sea-level Raptor engines were delivered to Boca Chica on different days last week. And on Saturday, two vacuum variants of the Raptors were delivered to the site in giant trucks. According to Elon Musk, Starship will make its maiden orbital test flight with all of its engines fitted, requiring SpaceX to manufacture, verify, and ship at least 35 new Raptors for a single flight. Musk says that the next generation of Starship's Raptor engine is a major improvement in simplification with increased thrust, and SpaceX is targeting engine cost below $1,000 per ton of thrust. SpaceX recently completed the assembly of the 100th full-scale Raptor engine at its Hawthorne factory, signaling that the engines required for Starship's orbital launch debut will be ready to fly soon. Per its label, RB-16 is the 16th Raptor boost engine built by SpaceX. Boost refers to the particular variant of Raptor engine specifically designed for an outer ring of fixed 20 engines on the booster. 
In his recent tweet, Elon Musk mentioned that SpaceX is about to begin the construction of a much larger high bay adjacent to the existing structure. The existing high bay building is an 82 meters tall structure used to complete the assembly of Starship and Super Heavy boosters. According to Musk, the newest addition to SpaceX's Starship production facility will be located just north of the existing high bay. The mega bay will only be a little taller than the high bay, but will have a much bigger base and two gantry cranes that run full span to stack the Starships and Super Heavy boosters. With this, we have covered all the major updates from last week. Please share your thoughts on the latest science news and Starship updates in the comments section. Also, do not forget to subscribe to the channel for more weekly updates. And as always, thanks for watching.